There is help in hard times. Isn't that all we know for each other? Thank you, Angela. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I want to welcome back Nioke Kane Barrett. Uh, hopefully, some of you were with us just a few weeks ago when she joined us and uh, led us in chanting. And again, this, this lovely reminder that. When it's even when it's dark, there is light and joy that is available to us. Uh, Mioke, and maybe know a little something about that as the first woman and the first uh, Westerner to hold the position of bishop in the Nishran Order of North America. Uh, she is presently the resident priest at Mioke and G Temple in Houston. So glad you could come back, be with us today, which is also hmm, the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And so there has been a lot of honoring of his life and um, the great sacrifice that his life was for many of us to wake up to the reality that we are swimming in. So, so glad all of you could join today also. Yeah, and with that, I'll hand it over to Miyoke. I wondered today what it was, that synchronicity that I would do the first uh, vigil on the day the verdict came down. And now here the one year anniversary and we're still uh, fighting and struggling and working to get changes made. But changes are happening. Even as we're seeing just tremendous opposition to getting to a place that is equitable and you know democratic for all of us. And one of the things that came up today, uh, listening to all of this, because George Floyd grew up here in Houston, so it's particularly close for some of the people in my neighborhood. Um, but people are still trying to denigrate the man, that he was a bad person, he was a criminal. And I, you know, I wonder what these people think if they were always judged by the worst thing they had ever done. And I wish that on none of us, you know, because we always have the opportunity to change, to grow, and we are so fortunate. This is also the time of celebrating Vesak in many different parts of the world. And also there's a new moon tomorrow. I think it's supposed to be a red moon um, that's going to happen tomorrow morning. So it should be visible on the early morning horizon as the moon and the sun come together. I thought it's a good omen for us. You know, we have to look at what's happening around us to really begin to understand uh, what time it is, where we are in the long cycle of our lives and in the cycle of practicing our faith. None of us would be here were it not for the fact that we had been here before, that we had some time long ago met up with the Buddha and said, okay, I'm gonna come back in the 21, the 20,000s or the 2000s 
and I have to deal with all the crap I can imagine and even stuff I can't imagine. Um, which brings me to a story I came across uh, about a year ago. It was in one of the writings for our founder, Nitrin Shonen, and he was writing to uh, one of his followers. What's significant in this letter that he wrote to her back in that time, most of the women that you would encounter in his writings never had their own names because it was only so-and-so's mother or so-and-so's wife. They never were given, at least for the rest of us to know, uh, their own name as, you know, like Anne or something. This woman, because she was a nun, as well as a widow and a mother, had her name because he had given it to her. So that's one of the significance of this letter. And uh, he's writing to her following the death of her husband. And she's not really that healthy. And she has kids that she's trying to take care of. And he's telling her to remember that he's there, you know, that he is there to support her. You know, like the song said, there's help in hard times. But one of the things he was talking about uh, was about human beings having parents. And when one parent is missing, it is difficult for the children to grow up. Your late husband left behind a daughter, a son who is ill and their mother who is not in good health. With whom did he leave these worries when he left this world? When Shakyamuni Buddha was about to pass away, he lamented, I will die soon. My only worry concerns King Ajatasatru. And King Ajatasatru had uh, become a follower of the Buddha, but he was also closely connected to the Buddha's cousin, Devadatta. And if you know anything about Devadatta, was that he was the one who tried to uh, kill the Buddha. And he also tried to break up the Sangha because he didn't like what he saw with all these people following the Buddha. And uh, King Ajatasatru's father was Bimbisara. And so because of the influence of his hanging around with Devadatta, he uh, was convinced to kill his own father. And so when the Bodhisattva heard the Buddha say he was worried about King Ajatasatru, he said, the compassion of the Buddha should extend equally to all. Your life should be considered precious for the sake of all living beings. Why do you only think of King Ajatasatru? The Buddha answered, suppose a couple has seven children, one of whom falls ill. Although the children are equal in the hearts of the parents, they worry most about the sixth child. Grandmaster Tiantai interprets this uh, scriptural passage as the Buddha answered, although the love of parents for their seven children is not biased, they worry especially about the sick one. Thus, even if parents have many children, they pay special attention to the one who is ill. All living beings are the children of the Buddha. Among them, the sinful ones who kill their parents or become enemies of Buddhism are like the sick child. As the Buddha approached death, he worried that Ajatasatru was the king of the Magadha kingdom. He killed King Bimbisara, who was my great supporter, thus becoming an enemy of the Buddha. As a result, heavenly beings abandoned him. A crisis among the sun and moon arose. The god of earth shook in anger. The people turned against the Buddha Dharma and foreign troops approached to attack the Magadha kingdom. All this happened because the king followed the wicked Devadatta as his teacher. As a result, the king will suffer a malignant rash and fall into the hell of incessant suffering on the seventh day of the third month. This saddens me and makes it difficult for me to pass away. Thus the Buddha lamented, if I were able to save King Ajatasatru now, 
all sinners would be saved as in the same way. When I read this, I was thinking of uh, Black Lives Matter because I wanted to find some writing, some words somewhere in the Buddhist teachings that would apply to the situation of Black Lives Matter. And this is what opened up before me. And I thought, wow, that's pretty incredible that the Buddha is paying attention to the one who is sick, the one who is in need. And if that person can be saved, then all can be saved. And it's kind of the same message that we're hearing with Black Lives Matter and that we have come to reckon with, with the death of George Floyd, because this was a major turning point, even as we still see the struggle to move beyond that turning point. And when we think about all of the things that are happening now, because there's a lot of, as we, the Buddha would say, a lot of his children are sick, the Asian Pacific Islanders, the uh, now all the trouble against the Jews and the Palestinians and just everybody and all of the angst that people are feeling and wanting to rise up and arm themselves and walk around and not have the same things for all beings for all beings to be treated equally, for all beings to have the same rights and privileges. It is our time as Buddhas and Bodhisattvas because this was the commitment we made. And one of the things that the Buddha says in the Lotus Sutra is that he promises awakening the enlightenment that he achieved to all beings. And it didn't matter where you came from, who you were, exactly as you are, you can walk the Buddha path. You don't have to be like in the old days when they would tell women, you have to be reborn as a man. You know, women don't have to do that anymore. We can actually, as women, just go ahead and become awakened. And anyone who follows the path can become awakened. And that gift, that promise from the Buddha really reveals a lot in terms of all this, the strife and struggle that's happening because those who are ill now can all be saved. We just have to remember that all of us are children of the Buddha. All of them who can walk this path are guaranteed their absolute awakening just as the Buddha did. And, he, and I'm always reminded of his words that I don't see this one or that one. All are the same to me. And that his teachings rain down on all of us, the same as to one, as to the many. And it's our mission, as it were, because we are here as practicing Buddhists, that we made an agreement somewhere along the line that we're coming back, we're in this time zone, or this time period where our efforts are needed, that we have to be the ones, as they say everywhere, we're the ones we've been waiting for. Uh, the world has been waiting for us to stand up and not on anything but the faith that enlightenment comes to all as long as we practice. And that's all we have to do. It doesn't require us to be extraordinary. It requires us to be diligent and perseverant, uh, to have perseverance and patience and to recognize that everything that happens to us is for our own good because it leads to our growth and our awakening, even the difficult things. And those are the most uh, challenging ones that we have to face, I think. Even though at the same time, when we have too much, um, I guess you could say too much happiness, we can get off track, you know, and walk another path. But all of those, we're not swayed by those things. 
we persevere on our path, we continue to walk the path, continue to challenge ourselves to embody the principles of Buddhism. And that's a commitment I think we all made when we took refuge, when we repeat the four great vows and meta prayers that we are connected to a world that we envision that has equity, equality, and peace. And we can make that happen. Simply as much as the Buddha talks about King Ajatasattu. Do you know the story of the demon queen, Hariti Kishimojin? It's my favorite. Um, she would always kidnap and um, human children and feed them to her children. And the villagers were like so upset that they finally went to the Buddha and said, um, you have to help us. You know, somehow we have to stop her from taking our children. So the Buddha did the simplest thing. He took one of her children and she was so distraught and running around trying to find her child that she finally went to the Buddha and said, I can't find my child, you have to help. And he says to her, now you know what these human parents are feeling. So you need to stop taking their children. So Kishimojin is um, used or Hariti decided that uh, she would stop and she would protect followers of the Buddha. And so she stopped eating human children and instead uh, said, it is said she eats pomegranates now, but she's still a demon queen. <laughs> and all of her uh, demon daughters no longer eat human children as well. They are protectors of children. Now, if you, I'm gonna get up for a second because I'm gonna bring her to you. She's used a lot in esoteric practices. Can you see her wicked face? <laughs> now, when I got this statue, I was uh, I had just been ordained and I, I was walking by the store and she was in the window and I saw her and I thought I have to take her home with me. And I didn't have that kind of money. So I knew I was coming back the next year. And I said, if she's there next year, she's gonna come home with me. So she was there waiting for me. And a lot of times in Japan, they don't like this demon woman. They want the beautiful one with the long flowing hair that has children. I happen to love this demon queen just the way she is because it's, uh, she's such a reminder that you don't have to change. All you must do is commit to your practice. And even demons can be awakened and gain their enlightenment. She's used a lot in our esoteric practices. And this one in particular uh, is housed at, or one similar is housed at the place where they do the uh, uh, hundred day um, austere practices of ice cold water baths and rice and gruel for a hundred days in the winter only for guys. But anyway, she's the one everybody prays to for strength and wisdom and the ability to protect. So I introduce you to her so that you can also keep her in mind for yourselves um, when it gets tough. And to remember Hariti or Kishimojin is always there protecting the practitioners the followers of the Buddha. 
Are there any questions that you might have? Okay, I wonder if you could say more about um, about that story. I'm not familiar with that teaching, and I'll be honest, it sounds a lot like an eye for an eye, right? Just Which one? Other her... people's children. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't eat her child, presumably, but <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like. That, that's, a, I think, a, a risky place, you know, trying to help someone understand or teach them a lesson to engage in the same uh, sorry, miserable behavior. Yeah. So I wonder if you can just say more about, uh, yeah, just say more about this. that. Well, you know, the story is actually pretty horrible when you think about it, right? Um, and the first time I ever heard it, I thought, uh, oh my gosh, um, a demon. And I have to admit that um, when I was, uh, my temple was often asked to um, be a place where uh, chaplains were, would come to experience a different faith from their own traditions. Um, she would scare people into leaving because some of them were like, they're worshiping devils, you know, uh, because of that. Not understanding in spite of having it explained that we all have uh, parts of us that are angry, that are animalistic, that are governed by greed and hunger and all those things. We all have those. One of the major teachings in our tradition is about our, um, I think most people call it the six realms and the four heavenly abodes, um, the hell, hunger, anger, animality, rapture and learning, then uh, Shravaka, Prachaka, Buddha, Bodhisattva, and Buddha. All of those things are inherent in all of us. And what Kishimojin or Hariti represents is that time when there's a dominance of greed and anger and animality and hunger, the you know, most of the six lower worlds, and how even in spite of that, the potential for Buddhahood is always there in all of us, uh, no matter what. And once we can awaken to the understanding of those, that 10 realms and how it shows up on our, in our lives, um, there's also, we have those 10 realms times 10 factors, which are things like appearance, our nature, our environmental causes, all of those things. The same with Hariti or Kishimoji, that her appearance as a demon would freak people out most of the time with her you know, bloody fangs and all that. Um, but to really begin to understand that that too is in us and the power of our faith and practice is such that even in spite of that, we can bring forth our Buddha nature in the midst of that anger, in the midst of that uh, animality, um, and hunger, all of those contain within themselves the other nine worlds, the nine realms. I wonder if I have that. And with those <clears throat> realms, um, say you're in the world of animality like uh, Kishimoji, and you could see that her face reflects that animality, right? It's the same for us. That when we are angry, when we are hungry, 
if we are dominated by those kinds of conditions, then it's quite evident, even if we don't think so, that it's reflected in uh, the way we embody ourselves. So if I'm walking around always angry, and I used to be like that, uh, which is why Hariti always appeals to me. Um, that's what the kind of nature that I express to other people was my anger nature. And when I started to overcome it and really change the way I looked at the world, then I was able to see how much it was reflected in my life. And so the, the beauty of us all as practitioners is that wherever we started from, like Hariti, Kishimoji, um, we have the ability to transform simply through our practice. And so that the Buddha nature that we all possess can shine through. And it gets to a point where the Buddha nature becomes the foundation of your entire life so that you have a greater capacity that when you are in the world of anger, a thought will take you out of that world and put you into another one. You can transport yourself into Bodhisattva or into Prachaka Buddha or Shravaka. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> it's one of uh, a concept I've been wrestling with for many years uh, because I see it as the key to helping people understand each other because we are all the same that way. We all have a Buddha nature and we are also governed by for many of us, a primary nature based on what happened to us throughout our lives. Now, I learned through my practice that I was angry because as a child, I was spanked. And, you know, I, I felt a sense of betrayal because my father, my, both my parents were, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child kind of thing. And so that just kind of busted my, uh, life condition to anger. But I never understood that what I was presenting was anger until I started paying attention to the people who showed up in my life and the things that they would do. And I realized that what I was attracting in my life was the result of my own life condition. I started to understand that and really work to change that, to deepen my understanding of what was the cause of it. Um, and the day I realized that it was based on anger, primarily at my father, I understood the key to all of my relationships and why they were so miserable. And once that happened, I met my husband. <laughs> so everything had transformed. And I couldn't believe it at first. but. It was something that was, there was a definite break with the past and a definite walking into a different space in the future kind of thing that happened. And that's really kind of what Kishimojin is, is representative of. Um, I mean, the stories that we hear told are, I think, you know, very simplistic from the standpoint of when they were told. Um, I think we'd hear different stories today, right? Trying to uh, open us up in a different way, but also in a very similar way to keep us awakened and constantly peeling that onion back to delve deeper into um, our own true natures. It's a long process, right? We're constantly peeling that onion. Now, I think of, um, was it David White? But he says, revelations can be terrible. <laughs> you know, I always remember that line that he said. And how we are so not ready 
that we silence our voices, afraid as we are of who might join us in having those revelations. I have to find that poem. Was that clear for the rest of you? You know, we're so used to being measured, you know, by other people's standards um, and things that really have no reference point for us. You know, we're trying to reach something that has nothing to do with who we are. That being able to just say, I'm a demon and I can practice Buddhism and become awake. It's like, wow, that's amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, and we don't even know, I think most of us, the extent of all that is given to us through the Buddhist teachings. When he says um, that we can reach exactly what he achieved. And I don't know if any of us has a real idea of what that is. You know, what does it mean to be awake, to be enlightened? And, and we might say that it's the ability to see reality as it is and accept it that way. And it doesn't shake you one way or the other. You just see it you live it, you walk it, everything. And in the midst of all of that, there is joy because you constantly polish the mirror of your life so that your life is always, always giving out the light of your practice. I think we are very fortunate people just because of that. And it's hard sometimes I think to also uh, leave behind the things we were taught before. Because Buddhism teaches us that we are all potential Buddhas. Took me a long time to leave that other stuff behind. You know, it said I was a sinner from the moment I was born. That's why I love Buddhism so much because it was like, you're free finally from that sin. Um, and we don't have to talk about that anymore. Any other questions? I think we all tend to feel that way. You know, one of the things I remind myself is that uh, there was an expression, the mind is like a garden, so be careful what you plant in it. And one of the things that uh, so many of us do is that when we have prayer, we pray from the standpoint, I know this isn't gonna happen, but I'm gonna pray for it anyway. And I learned one thing was that as you think is how it will be because the mind is so powerful. And with your mind, you create your reality. And so a part of our practice is to be able to create the world we want to see in our minds, in our hearts. So it's to remember that if we are putting out and creating a world whose prototype is based on a negative rather than a positive, 
that's what we're going to get because we bring that into being, as it were. And part of the, uh, when I think of our practice and what we're doing, we're trying to find in it the deeper levels of ourselves through our practice, right? To master our minds rather than have our minds be our master. Is that, yes, we can have fear, but we also have the tools, you know, the practicing the paramitas, for example, to be able to overcome those fears. Um, we have so many little concepts and principles that when we apply them to our lives, they can open us up in such a way that, um, how you could say like crack you open like an, a walnut, you know, that, um, what was it Leonard Cohen said that there's cracks and that's where the light can get in. That's where the cracks, why you have those cracks. I'm not quoting that terribly right, but something about the cracks leaves a space for light to come in and also light to come out that what is negative within us is something that we have to master. That's our job. You know, in, in our fear, we might do some things that we would not even think about doing if we were not afraid. So how do we conquer fear? How do we conquer the things within that limit our ability to be in joy, to be in light, to be in hope, is to constantly take those things out and examine, and we call it polishing the mirror of your life. That when you see it in your life, it's like taking, a, your practice is like taking a, a Brillo pad and scraping off all that kind of negative stuff off your life. I don't know if I'm being so clear because uh, I know that for myself that I, I started to lose fear of my weaknesses because I knew through my practice that I could handle the weaknesses when they appeared. You know, because one of the things that when we practice enough and deepen our faith in our practice is that we learn to really trust who we are. And so even if we don't know what's happening or what's going to happen, or you know, how would I handle this horrible situation? The one thing we gain is trust in our ability to handle anything. I remember when I was younger um, <clears throat> that there was a, um, a man who came to my house and started talking about how he was going to rape me. And I was freaking out, you know, but then I got really, really angry. And inside I was chanting, you know, to myself <clears throat> and I, I got very calm and I said to him, you could do to me whatever you wish, but know that I will haunt you to the end of my days. And I don't know what it was that he sensed or saw in me, but he left. You know, at first he laughed at me, but he finally just left without doing anything to me. And that was one of the starts of my understanding, the power that I had to project the strength of my own life, the strength of my own uh, will, and that I could begin to trust myself to handle things when I had no clue as to what I was going to do. And I've had you know, many different kinds of situations um, that I haven't always been safe, 
and I have been, you know, I look back now and I think I'm surprised I'm still alive because, you know, some of the stuff I did when I was younger, I should be dead or in jail or who knows. But there's, you know, when we recognize, and I think this is incumbent of all of us, this is our time as Buddhists, because uh, when we look at everything that has been set in motion by other faith traditions, uh, that we have the opportunity now to show something different, to really bring forward the power of the heart, the power of mind, the power of spirit. And it's not that they don't have it, the rest of them don't have it, they don't have a model of that, which exists in their own traditions as well. One of the most beautiful women I ever met was a, a woman in her 80s as she lay dying when she was a devout Catholic. And I've never seen such light coming from a life as that woman as she lay dying. And I know, uh, from everything I've read so far that, you know, there's in truth, one path and many different ways to walk it. And we're all after the same thing, even as people have uh, fallen off the path and doing the crazy stuff they do. That those of us who practice as Buddhist can be the light that brings people to a better place that brings people to recognize that there is light that is much better than the darkness people are selling these days. I know it's frightening, right? When you see the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the QAnons and all those kind of folks, um, and people buy into it because it's easy. They don't have to challenge themselves. And what we're doing as practitioners is very difficult because we really have to look at ourselves. We really have to examine our lives, examine the paths that we walk and examine how we show up. This is not for children, right? It's a grown up way to live. And we're up for the challenge. We just have to remember we chose it, right? And to remember that the things that happen to us again are for our good, always, even when it seems to be the worst possible thing that could happen. It is for our good and it's up to us to find what that good is. I hope that helps. We've taken on a huge task, people. <laughs> but I'm confident we can make things happen. I have one song that I want to play for you. So impossible takes just a little more time, right? I appreciate the song and what's even, what came up for me even before the song um, to talk about the depth of practice and it really being um, the thing that strengthens us to stay with things just as they are. Um, and what I, I talk to friends and people that I'm close to and care deeply about. And one of the things I hear um, again and again is uh, it's not the seeing or understanding the direction that, that we're being called in. It is um, the fear of loss, loss of community and going in this maybe new direction or uh, feels solitary. And so I wonder if you can speak to 
just that that place that can feel alone and isolating. Maybe you even see the direction to go, but you don't see anyone waiting on the other side for you, so to speak. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And especially when, you know, maybe we're going against all of that family conditioning, you know, the social conditioning we can establish some boundaries with, but it's harder when we're going against our community, and how we've been raised, how we've, yeah. So I wonder if you can speak to, I appreciate your story of, and that's a, a wonderful story. And I will hold that experience, just that fierceness coming back to your practice and chanting even silently to yourself and standing up and still your community was with you right so your community your community wasn't going to say oh you shouldn't have done that no one's going to say that yeah right? yeah and in the face of racism you know like oh don't make waves or oh now's not the time or oh they're just you know they're just like that or, I hear that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you speak to that? Because <laughs> I'm, you know, I get um, sometimes from my community because I am uh, the only woman of color, except for the uh, Japanese women. Um, and so when I would say things, they would say, you're not supposed to talk about that, you know, because you're supposed to lead us in faith. And I said, this is faith because who I am is an expression of my faith, you know? And even if there's no one there to walk with me, I have to walk this path. Um, and I, I remember the first time I stood up for myself that way it was such an incredible victory for me because it was something I never would have done before. But the cost of not doing so was greater than the cost of doing it. And I remembered largely because of my dad you know, my dad and I became very close after my awakening as to why I was so angry all the time. Um, and we became better friends. And I was able to see the man that he had hidden because, you know, he was at that time in the military, he had a family to take care of. And as much as he might have wanted to like go and march with Dr. King or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. He couldn't do it because of his obligation to his family and his obligation as a soldier. And that's what gave me the courage to try because I saw what it cost him to not be able to do it. Um, and we all have different examples of folks in our lives that we may never think about looking at them that way. You know, even my mother's strength of coming to this country as a foreigner and um, I never was raised to look at my mother as a strong woman. And I found out this woman has a backbone of steel, uh, but I never knew that. And only through practice, and not looking at people as like my mom or my dad, but as human beings who have their own struggles. Was I able to see the gifts that they had given me and take them on as a charge in my own life, even at the times when I felt the weakest. And there were small steps, you know, that, um, even with racism, to be able to say to people, this is a fight we have to win. We have to pursue this battle. You know, we have to keep walking this struggle because 
until enough of us realize that it's not just uh, black folks or Asian folks or Jewish people, that all of our souls, our spirits are at risk. You know, that if we do nothing, then we have given up the best of ourselves. That we have said that our Buddha nature doesn't mean anything. That the gifts we have that have led us to struggle, to have overcome everything we've overcome before will have meant nothing because we didn't take those gifts and use them to pass them on. Even as we are alone, because there are always those that are watching. And interestingly enough, this came up for me uh, last week. There was a community I was a part of and uh, when I uh, left my first Buddhist community, I had nowhere to go. So I went to this uh, religious science church because they were reading a book, uh, The Four Agreements. And I thought, well, if they're reading this book, they can't be all bad. So I'm going to go check them out. And it was the craziest church I'd ever been to in my entire life. <laughs> because, you know, there were people hugging each other in church. I'd never seen that before. And, you know, couples sitting together like this during the service. And I'm looking around thinking, this is a whack place. And they would get up in the middle of the service and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life and go around hugging everybody. I thought, wow, this is a trip. <laughs> but what that was, was such a healing place for me because it taught me, it showed me the negativity that others had put on me, you know, to say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have enough faith, blah, blah, blah. And these people walked their walk and they kept saying, I'm grateful for the good in your life. And I kept thinking, I have no good in my life. But after about a year and I started to really understand what they were saying, that there is good in all of us. And we should be grateful for that in every single being that we encounter. And that was the beginning of a shift in how I saw myself. And I learned also because I saw myself in such a negative way, I could not see others in a good way because it was always, what are they after? You know, because people always had a cost for whatever they did for you is how I'd been raised in my previous community. And I did not realize how much I was visible going through all of that. And last week I heard from several people uh, that they had been watching me for all these years. And because of me, this is why they pursued a path in the ministry or you know, decided to pursue their dreams because they saw me do it. I thought, okay, people are watching, <laughs> you know, even if they're not walking with us, they may be following us, coming up behind us. And so that what we do always leads, leaves a road open for others to follow, even if we don't know who they are. Now, sometimes I think we just have to put up with being alone, you know, but then even when we think we are alone, that something happens to let us know we're not because there's plenty of us out here who are walking uh, a path alone, but at the same time, um, without all of us walking together, nothing will change. It's, it's, I may have mentioned before my one expression that I think about, it's better for a thousand of us to take one step than for one of us to take a thousand steps. So we can walk together with others, you know, 
the other thing I do is interfaith work, even though that's sometimes horribly difficult, you know, uh, because it's always the Abrahamic traditions that act like nobody else is in the room. Um, but it's, it's been quite astonishing that the people I've met and encountered were speaking the same language, you know, even as they're in different traditions that we are wa walking together and working together to try to make a difference. So there's people out there. And the more we find each other, the greater the spread. And somehow we'll turn this uh, world around, as Harry Belafonte would say, turn the world around. <laughs> yeah. We just have to remember to call each other when we're feeling alone. Because <laughs> sometimes just saying hello, how are you to another friend is such a gift. Thank you. I love people who cuss. <laughs> that I don't feel badly about doing it myself. <laughs> Happy to hear that. It, it takes all of us. It reminds me of Sangha, that often we forget about the fact that we have a Sangha and how we operate as Sangha may have to deepen, you know, that we have to get to a place where we trust each other enough um, to be tr uh, truthful, to be open. Because otherwise, um, it just doesn't work. And one thing I, I, I wanted to mention, uh, Stacy, was that one of the things that happened for me uh, during the pandemic and continued, is the more I stuck to my guns about talking about social justice issues and all of that, that uh, the people around me started to change. And so there are more people around me now who are into social, social justice. So it does get better. We have about nine minutes. And okay. I wonder if we might uh, sit together in silence, honoring those last nine minutes of George Floyd's life. Sure.
whatever merit, goodness, wisdom arose from our time together this evening, from our practice. We offer this far and wide, above and below, about all beings, without exception, you know, the sources of happiness and peace. May all hearts be at ease. May all beings be happy. May it be so. Thank you so much for your practice, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back and joining with us, Mioke. So sweet to have you. Shelly has offered in the chat um, an opportunity to support Mioke's livelihood. You can visit the website to offer Donna to Mioke. Um, just as others before us were generous in their offerings so that we may come together in this way. We are setting in motion this goodness of practice for those yet to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Keep on walking.